a few seconds uh, early. So if you'd like to start, I will mute my mic and just let me know if at any time you need me to unmute and um, I'll respond to you. OK, thank you. Then uh, thank you very much, Nick, uh, for organising uh, this event. And thank you very much to the Krella team for, for inviting me. I feel very honoured. And also thank you to all of you for joining this event. I have to say I've never given an online talk and not so many people, so I'm slightly nervous, but hopefully all will go well in terms of technology and the talk as well. The study I've been reporting on was conducted as part of a larger ETS project uh, funded by Educational Testing Service, and it was a team uh, who worked together. I was the leader of the project, but um, I had Maria Michelle, Shia Jean Lu, Nataria Kurtali, Min Jin Li, and Lais Borsch as collaborators. So this is not just my work, but it's everyone's work um, I'm presenting on today. The title of the talk is The Role of Proficiency in Second Language Writing Processes. First, let me start with a brief background to the study. The last few decades have seen a significant advancement in describing and understanding second language writing processes. Much of this work has been cognitive in orientation. It has been concerned with capturing online writing behaviors. These are the directly observable characteristics of the writing process, such as posing and revision. This research has also been concerned with investigating the cognitive processes that underline these behaviours, such as planning and linguistic encoding. For the purposes of our research, we adopted Kellogg's model of writing, among the many other uh, writing models that have inspired previous research on writing processes. This model conceptualises writing in terms of three sub-processes, formulation, execution and monitoring. Formulation involves planning the content and organization of the written piece and translating that, uh, that plan into linguistic form through the processes of lexical retrieval, syntactic encoding and cohesion. At the execution stage, motor movements are used to produce either a handwritten or a typed text. While we write, we also monitor our performance, we reread what we have written, we also edit our text to make sure that it reflects our intended content. This is an interactive model. All of these uh, processes are supposed to work in parallel. But how can we test this and other theoretical models of writing? So far, researchers have primarily relied on introspective methods, such as the think aloud and stimulated recall procedure. But probably due to limitations associated with these techniques, Researchers increasingly use keystroke logging to investigate writing processes. Keystroke logging involves recording of the keystrokes and mouse movements of writers. Uh, this is a very powerful technique because we, can, we get online information about writing processes. One limitation of this technique, however, is it provides no information about reading processes during writing. A way to address this limitation is to combine keystroke logging with eye tracking methodology. Eye tracking records our eye fixations or eye gazes on a visual stimulus, in our case, uh, most likely the uh, screen, if we type uh, our uh, written piece. Between these eye fixations, there are also so-called saccades. These are the little jumps that our eye gazes make um, between movements. So far, um, writing researchers have used these techniques usually in isolation, or maybe they use two of these techniques together, but very few studies have combined all three methodologies together. This is something we try to do in this study as well, in order to get a more valid and fuller picture of the writing process. We were also interested in the role of proficiency when it comes to writing. Based on Kellogg's model, we thought there would be strong relationships between proficiency and writing processes. Given that higher proficiency writers have more automatized linguistic skills, we assumed that probably they would be more able to handle the competing demands posed by planning, translation and monitoring processes. As a result, we expected increased speed fluency in writing, also less frequent and shorter pauses, especially at lower texture units, because from previous research we know that at lower texture units there is a greater likelihood that participants um, engage in linguistic encoding processes. 
We also expected less local viewing behavior. We assume that higher proficiency writers would have more attentional resources to go back in their text, to monitor their uh, writing, and also generate content through rereading what they've written, leading to a more global viewing behavior. Previous research has found some confirmation uh, for these predictions for internal cognitive processes, also for speech fluency. When it comes to pausing, the results of previous research are mixed. And when it comes to eye gaze behavior, the eye gaze behaviors, the single studies that has investigated the relationship between proficiency and writing, prof uh, writing processes yielded null findings. To sum up, researchers have begun to explore the relationship of proficiency to second language writers' behaviors and associated cognitive processes, but there is need for more research because the current findings are mixed and still limited. So against this background, we, followed, uh, uh, we formed the following research question. To what extent does proficiency affect the cognitive processes of second language writers as reflected in speed fluency, posing behaviors, eye gaze behaviors, and stimulated recall comments. Our participants were 60 Chinos, Chinese second language users of English. Altogether, we collected 240 writing performances. All our participants were international students at the University of London. They came from various levels of proficiency, 20 CFRC1, 20 B2, and 20 B1 uh, participants. Their proficiency level was determined by the TOEFL IBT listening and reading components. The mean age was 24, around 24, and the majority were female. What did they do? First, in a group session, they were administered the TOEFL IBT listening and reading components, which was followed by a typing test. Then they took part in individual sessions in an eye-tracking lab, two of these, and each of the two sessions, they wrote two TOEFL IBT writing tests. While they were writing, we used the input log software to record their keystrokes, and we also used an iLink 1000 eye tracker to capture their eye movements. Out of the four writing tasks, two were integrated tasks and two were independent tasks. The order of these tasks was counterbalanced across participants and sessions. The integrated tasks um, involved reading a passage, then listening to a lecture, and then the participant's task was to summarize the points made in the lecture, explaining how they cast doubt on the points that were made in the reading. The independent tasks were typical essay writing tasks. Uh, participants were, given, um, were asked to write an argumentative essay on a given topic. Then, uh, finally, participants engaged in a stimulated recall session. This was based on the last writing task they performed. Participants watched recording of their own writing performance. While they were doing this, their keystrokes and eye gaze recordings were available. They were encouraged to stop the recording at any time. And the researcher also stopped the recording and elicited their thoughts when they paused or revised their production, but they didn't volunteer their com uh, any comments on their own. These sessions were conducted in Mandarin, the participant's first language. Here is one type of output that the input log software generates. It shows the text that has been written and also what has been revised. It also gives indication about the pauses, where they occurred and how long they were. In this case, we had a pause of 7,348 milliseconds, a long pause, and it occurred between the words history and end. Keystroke logging software also gives information about what function keys were used. For example, in this case, the participants almost deleted everything they've written. You can also get some friendlier outputs from input log. You can get some automatic indices for pausing, length of pauses, and also the number of pauses. We, these are the two measures we obtained, and we also classified these uh, pausing behaviors according to text location, whether they occurred within words, between words, or between sentences. Our pause threshold was 200 milliseconds, which counts as a low threshold um, when it comes to a study of writing. Normally, studies adopt a 2,000 millisecond uh, threshold, but this doesn't allow for capturing lower-level writing processes. 
The reason why we looked at tax location was because, as I mentioned earlier from previous research, we know that posing at lower textual units tends to be associated with lower level writing processes, linguistic encoding processes. When it comes to the eye-checking data, we use SR Data Viewer to analyze um, the data we got. First, we identified our area of interest, which was the writing window. Then we extracted eye-checking indices for the full writing process uh, for the following measures. Total fixation count, total fixation time, median length of fixation, number of forward and backward saccades. Saccades uh, are the little jumps, again, between the eye gazes the median length of forward and backward saccades, and the proportion of backward saccades. This last index showed whether participants would be more likely to go forward or backward by rereading or by looking at uh, the screen. The stimulated eco comments were classified according to Kellogg's model um, into planning related, translation related, and monitoring related comments. Let me give you some examples now. Here comes a stimulated eco comment about planning. I was thinking what to write for the second point. An example for organization. I was thinking I would write two paragraphs to support my view and write another paragraph starting with admittedly. An example for lexical retrieval. I was thinking what verb to use after two. The words I used were very similar to those in the question. Syntactic encoding. I was thinking of adding a clause after study the subjects to express you're interested in. I didn't want to phrase it in the same way as the question did. Cohesion, I was wondering what linking, linking word to use here. And finally, monitoring. I was reading the sentence again to see whether, whether conveyed what I wanted to express. The writing performances were scored by two independent ETS raters and they employed the TOEFL writing rubric. Before we ran our main analyses, we ran a few preliminary analyses. This involved running Spearman correlations among the proficiency scores, the TOEFL listening, reading and writing scores. We obtained strong correlations uh, between all of these um, performances. And since our focus was on writing, we decided to go with the writing proficiency scores as a proxy for proficiency in our further analyses. To obtain a more sophisticated measure of writing performances, we submitted the raw writing scores into many facet rash analyses. Our facets were personability, rater severity, and prompt difficulty, and we used the rating scale model. In our later analyses, we used the personability estimates as an indicator of proficiency. Before uh, presenting the main results of our study, let me remind you of the research question. To what extent does proficiency affect the cognitive processes of second language writers, as reflected in speech fluency, pausing behaviors, eye gaze behaviors, and stimulated recall comments? For the speech fluency, pausing behaviors, and eye gaze measures, we ran the following analyses. Um, a series of multi-level mixed models. First, we constructed null, model, null, null models. The dependent variable was a writing behavior index, and our random effects were participant and prompt. Then we added proficiency as a fixed effect and then likelihood ratio test to assess whether the addition of proficiency improved model fit. If a, significant, if a significant effect for proficiency was identified, we constructed maximum models by adding bi-prompt random slopes for proficiency. Out of the 18 writing behavior indices, proficiency emerged as a significant predictor for six measures. Number of characters per p-burst, medium pause length for total, also within words and between words, the number of pauses between words and between sentences, and a single eye-checking measure, mean fixation length. Here you can see the results for speed fluency. On the x-axis, there is proficiency, and on the y-axis, the number of characters per p-burst. As you can see, as proficiency increased, the participants produced more characters per p-burst. These are the number of characters between pauses and the effect size was medium. These are the results for medium pause length. You can see the results for total within words and between words. Again, the x-axis shows proficiency and the y-axis, the, uh, the medium pause uh, length uh, participants showed. Again, as proficiency increased, participants produced shorter pauses overall with a small effect, sizes, uh, small effect size 
also shorter pauses within words and between words with small and medium effect sizes respectively. Moving on to pause frequency, again, um, proficiency increased participants pause more frequently between words. Uh, the effect size was medium for this relationship and also between sentences, here the effect size was found to be small. And finally, here come the results for mean fixation length. Again, the more proficient participants were, they produced longer eye fixations and the effect size for this relationship was found to be small. So what about the simulated recall comments? We ran a series of simple regression analyses where the predictor was proficiency and our dependent variable was the proportion of simulated recall comments on planning, translation or monitoring, all in separate analyses. We found a significant relationship for only one of the, uh, one of the dependent variables within word uh, pauses and translation related comments. We found that lower proficiency writers refer, refer to translation related, linguistic encoded related comments more frequently when they describe their thought processes when they pause within words. The fact size for this relationship was small. So to summarize, what we found was more proficient writers uh, wrote faster. They made shorter pauses at lower texture units within and between words and overall. They paused more between words and sentences. They displayed longer eye fixations on average and they reported fewer translation related processes within word pauses. So what do these findings mean? You might remember that we predicted that higher proficiency writers would be more able to handle competing demands on planning, translation and monitoring processes. And we did find some evidence for this prediction in our data. Indeed, higher proficiency students produced fewer translation related comments for within word pauses. Probably more proficient writers struggled less with lexical access and morphological encoding. It's also important to note, however, that proficiency had a weak relationship to, num to number of planning, translation and monitoring related stimulated recall comments overall. This might have been an artifact of the, dem of the demanding nature of academic writing. Um, writing an academic test was also difficult for higher proficiency writers. Another possibility is that the differences lay in implicit learning processes, writing processes, which are impervious to awareness. So even if there were differences, these would not have been reflected in stimulated equal comments because this can only tap explicit um, thoughts, thoughts that we are aware of. We also predicted there would be increased speed fluency on the part of uh, our participants, uh, higher proficiency participants, and we did find confirmation for this prediction. Proficiency actually had the strongest relationship to writing fluency, explaining 30% of variance in scores. These results confirm findings of previous research. When it comes to pausing, uh, our results are mixed, similar to previous research. Like in Barkawi and as predicted, high proficiency participants pause shorter at lower texture units. Contrary to our predictions, however, higher, pushed, higher proficiency participants paused more often overall. What could explain this? One possible explanation is that we had a relatively low pause threshold, 200 milliseconds. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, 2000 milliseconds is traditionally used in writing. Probably high proficiency learners post for shorter periods more frequently than lower proficiency learners. And this might, have be, uh, this might account for uh, these patterns that we found in the data. Finally, what about uh, the eye checking data? We expected less local viewing behavior on the part of um, high proficiency participants, and we found no confirmation for this prediction. Unlike in Chukarev Udalainen research, who actually observed no, uh, who we observed no proficiency effects for circad length, but one difference between their study and ours was they looked, they compared L1 and L2 proficiency writers and uh, L1 and L2 writers, and we compared writers at different proficiency levels. We did observe, however, longer mean fixations for higher proficiency writers, which probably reflected deeper processing on their part. Why would they engage in deeper processing? Maybe during um, when they reread uh, their text uh, during planning and monitoring, they had to deal with a more complex text. 
as they themselves were more proficient writers, probably the text they produced uh, was more complex the, at that point in the writing process. So what are the implications of our findings? As I mentioned earlier, we found speed fluency to be the strongest predictor um, among uh, the writing behavior indices we investigated. This was the case regardless of task type. We found this as part of the larger project. So one implication, practical implication could be that spirit fluency could be integrated as an indicator of writing proficiency in automated scoring procedures. In terms of methodology, we did find that triangulating data from keystroke logging, eye tracking and stimulated recall was useful to gain insights about writing processes. This allowed us to tap both explicit and implicit processes, and we will also uh, be able to gain some insight into reading while writing. Of course, this study has several limitations and let me point to these and also some related future directions. We only examined uh, Chinese R2 writers, so in future research we uh, would need to study other L1 groups to see whether our findings are generalizable. Probably the biggest limitation has to do with the course eye gaze measures that we had. We only were able to focus on the whole writing window, originally we wanted to carry out word level analysis, but the font size was too small in the TOEFL IBT platform to do this. So hopefully in future research, um, more fine-grained indices can be obtained. For now, we only focus on a single area of interest, but we do have the data. So we could also examine how often um, participants gaze at the reading window, also the instructions um, and the timer. Finally, I already mentioned that we had a low uh, post stress for 200 milliseconds, which was an um, advantage in the sense that we were also able to capture lower level writing processes. But this limits uh, the comparability of our findings to other research. So in further research, it would be interesting to compare and calculate uh, or run this relationship for a longer threshold as well. For example, 1000 milliseconds or 2000 milliseconds. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention and also many thanks, many thanks to ETS for financial support. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Mm. Well done. That was uh, that was word perfect and uh, a really, really interesting presentation. So thank you very much. And um, I'm sure uh, as, as to be expected, we've had some really interesting um, questions that, that people have asked and some comments that have been made about, um, about the ideas that you've uh, spoken about. So if you can just give me a moment, I'm just going to um, have a quick check. Um, so the first question um, that, some, that somebody has asked, and it's something that I wondered about actually having done a little bit of eye tracking myself. And it was about participants maybe looking down at the keyboard while they're typing and thus losing um, you know, their, their eye signal. And obviously because you are uh, looking at pausing behaviors, potentially, depending on how good a typist they are um, and how much they're a type type, type type, that could have implications. So can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Yes, that's a really good point. Normally, I also do eye checking studies when uh, participants engage in reading or looking at subtitles, actually with Min Jin Lee, who is um, one of the uh, participants in the session. And there we would expect at least uh, 70 80 percent coverage meaning that participants look at the screen at least you know a certain amount of time if they don't we, we think that the data is not reliable um, in this case uh, i don't remember the concrete numbers anymore but i think we had like 40 or 50 percent uh, coverage so it was much uh, lower but that was something that we expected because their mm. participants looking at their notes and they were looking at the screen but that's why it was so helpful i didn't mention that but actually we video recorded uh, these sessions so we also had information about when they were looking at the screen and um, and when they were looking at their notes and and in we haven't done this type of research but in a very fine grade qualitative study it would be interesting to to integrate this for our future research a study that i'm planning to do actually with uh, with sasena from uh, from Kella, uh, we also, uh, when we recruit participants, we try to recruit touch typists exactly for this reason, people who can type 
without looking um, at the at the keyboard. So that would help with, with this issue. But that's a very it's a very good point. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, and there are also a, a few people have asked um, this question, and um, this is uh, about the possibility that writing proficiency in L1 may be impacting um, and affecting the writing proficiency um, in, in their L2. So, um, yes, we've got um, uh, three people that are asking um, that question. I totally agree. That's a limitation of our research. I wish we could have asked our, you know, if we could go back and then ask these participants to also write, <laughs> um, uh, you know, something in the L1. Uh, based on the data we have, we can't disentangle um, L2 writing proficiency for L1 writing proficiency. But again, in our next study, this is something we are planning to do. But you're absolutely right. This is a limitation of the research. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Um, and now just one more question uh, for you, Andrea, if, if you wouldn't mind. Um, this is uh, about the meaning of proficiency and, and kind of how that is interpreted. So um, one element of proficiency is to produce more coherent and cohesive text, which Possibly that involves more reflection and monitoring. So um, was there any evidence that pausing um, in more proficient writers was related perhaps to the, if you like, their thinking um, mm -hmm. during the, 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 as they were writing? And I, I, I have to say that the same thing occurred to me, whether the pausing um, and you mentioned fixations, might be to do with the fact that more proficient writers were perhaps uh, composing more complex ideas, more complex clauses or sentences. Um, and therefore, perhaps where normally you'd expect to see shorter fixations as people became more proficient, perhaps that that wasn't the case. Perhaps that accounted for, um, for what you found not fitting with perhaps expectations. Yes, I, I, I absolutely uh, agree that I think um, that was our idea as well, that the greater uh, fixation length, one possibility is that they, they, they reflect a greater depth of processing and maybe that had to do with conceptualization processes. This is something we, we didn't investigate when we looked at monitoring, uh, we looked at monitoring as a whole, but indeed, going back to the comment, it would be interesting to, deep it, uh, to, to break it down. Was it monitoring? Uh, linguistic features or coherence related comments probably there is a there might be a difference there we didn't uh, I, I, actually we do have the data but when we ran the analysis it just seemed it's too fine grade but uh, actually now that you say so probably we should do uh, and, and, and run those analyses uh, having said this uh, I don't think that's a, a, an explanation for uh, for the, um, the greater mean fixation length. But just to say um, what we also find in other areas of air to research that often uh, greater fixation length could also indicate difficulty, right? So that's it's very difficult yes. to create this sort of, uh, you know, eye checking measures. And originally we thought the longer the better, but often the longer actually can be an issue uh, in the sense that it, it means difficulty. Again, most likely not in the case of higher proficiency writers, but you also have to keep that in mind. But that's why it's so nice when we can triangulate data sources, uh, keystroke logging measures and, and eye checking data with stimulated JQuery comments. But then, of course, it's always complex and we have the issue of implicit and explicit because when it comes to our eye checking, that could be associated with processes we're not aware of. And with stimulated JQuery, we can only tap uh, processes that, um, that we're conscious of. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Andrea. Um, You've answered those questions brilliantly with no forewarning about what they were. Thank you so much. And um, thank you for such an interesting and stimulating presentation. There, I can see that um, it's generating.